Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 309, my chat with British improviser Rhiannon Jenkins. But first, let's talk about our sponsors. Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. Sign up today for your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. There are so many books out there. People are talking about all sorts of different stuff and it is always available on Audible. When your friends are like, did you hear about this cool new book? It's there. And Audible also has a bunch of original content as well. So there is so much for you. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet, please do. It just really has a lot out there. And if you, like me, don't have a minute to read a book, you can listen while you're driving around, running errands, doing a hundred things, picking up your kid at school, whatever it is, you can listen to your books through Audible. Get a free audiobook download when you sign up, as well as access to hundreds of books and podcasts. And you know you can listen to Yes But Why. I know you know because you're listening and I appreciate it. So go now to audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why to sign up and get your account today. Thanks guys. Yes but why podcast is also brought to you by podcastcadet.com. Podcastcadet.com is the company that my husband Chris and I run to help podcasters. We just want to be a resource for people like ourselves who are putting out podcasts to figure out how to get started. I was recently working with somebody on how to get organized, how to start their idea. They thought they had to do it all at once, and we figured out a schedule that would be more manageable with their real life. Because let's be honest, guys, we're making these podcasts while we're doing work, while we're taking care of our kids, while we're doing all the other stuff. And to manage that is so hard. So if you don't really know how to start, or if you really want to work on something, but like, where do I find the time and how do I get it done? Give us a call. We're happy to help you. Check out the website, podcastcadet.com, for all of the free content. And then if you need further help, just contact us through the website, and we'll chat and help you in whatever way that we can. And if it turns out that you purchase something from us, you know, we do some editing, we make a website for you maybe, you know, do a little marketing, who knows? You can mention code YBY20 and get 20% off the first service or workshop you buy. Let us help. We want to be there for you. We're podcasters just like you. Podcastcadet.com. This week on Yes But Why, I chat with improviser, director, teacher, Rhiannon Jenkins. Listen in as we chat about science, protests, and improvised musicals. We had a lot of fun. I now present to you Yes But Why, episode 309, Rhiannon Jenkins on teaching improv with an open, caring heart. Enjoy. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why. Yes, but why? 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 This is the Yes, but why podcast. Um, All right. So I love starting with this question. When you were a child, what was the way that you played with your uh, siblings or friends? Oh, good question. Uh, So I grew up in like a big family. My mom is Irish. So she is one of seven children. Um, And I have a brother and a sister and then about a million cousins. So, yeah, I was always pretty sociable. From when I was little, I had lots of cousins and my brother and sister around me. And then so, you know, when I went to school and started hanging out with other kids, I was always someone who liked having a lot of people around me and being around lots of other people. So, and I, I was kind of a funny kid I liked I really loved reading I just I just devoured books I would just read and read and read and read and read um but also I did like getting into scrapes and scraps you know um I would climb trees and fall out of them um 
I hurt myself a lot <laughs> as a kid just because I was quite clumsy. Like I would try and do sort of, I would try and do things and then scrape my knee or I, I remember once, <laughs> this is so silly, I remember I, my friend uh, David, who lived down the road from me, he got given an electric scooter, like as in a, a little like, you know, like the lime scooters you could rent. Yep. He got given one of those. I think we were maybe 10, 11. I think we were still at primary school. And our other friend, who I, I, I can't remember his name now, which is terrible, was was hanging out with us. So we put all three of us on this electric scooter and we're like, where's the biggest hill in town that we can find so that we can go down the hill with all three of us to see how fast we can get it going? Um and then obviously we crashed into somebody's fence and my friend got like bits of wood stuck in his knee. And then I had to like carry him back to my mom and be like, I injured my friend. <laughs> and mom was just so like, oh, okay. Yeah, all right. It, like, I think by this point, my parents were just so used to me being like, I've got a piece of glass stuck in my hand. Um <laughs> My mom, actually, my mom told me that there was a, there was a point when I was about, I don't remember this, I'm maybe two or three, where I injured myself so many times in such a short period of time that resulted in her having to take me to hospital that a nurse was like, we need to talk to you about like, are are you abusing this child because she keeps injuring herself? And mom was like, no, she's just an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) she just keeps like falling into or off of things and we're not i swear to god we're not doing anything bad to her she's just a moron so i feel like that is something that's come over into adult life i definitely fall down or like i still like climbing trees i got told actually i went to berkeley campus yesterday to have a wander around because i'd never been and I climbed a tree because there was just such an obviously climbable tree there. And I was on my own for about an hour waiting for Chris to come and meet me. And I was like, I'm going to go climb this tree and I'm just going to sit in the tree. I've just bought a bunch of books. I can sit in the tree and read a book and just like watch people walk past. And some like campus security guy was like, excuse me, you can't be in that tree. <laughs> and I was like, I don't go here. And he was like, yeah, okay. I mean, it's not that students aren't allowed in the tree. It's that people are not allowed in the trees. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll get down. Fine. Whatever. Um, (laughs) Was it like a special kind of tree or something? Like here in Austin, they protect oak trees. Like you can't mess with oak trees. Like if an oak tree is literally in front of the door of your business, blocking your sign, you, nobody knows you're there. You call the city and you're like, can I cut this tree? And they're like, no. No, you cannot make a sign that people can see through the tree. And you're like, Uh, (laughs) all right, great. Yeah, they protect the tree. So I wondered if perhaps it was a, um, some, you know, kind of tree that was special. And so they were like, listen, these are the special blank trees and you can't climb them because you'll hurt them. I don't know. I mean, it was a huge, huge tree. I don't think I would have, you know, it wasn't like I was cracking branches and (laughs) gradually falling down i was in i was perfectly safely ensconced in the tree i was in i was good the tree was not hurt the tree was a lot bigger than i am it could take me i think (laughs) the tree was Um, happy to have you there we don't know why this campus security guy gotta get involved (laughs) i'm having a relationship here okay (laughs) so fuck off bro (laughs) yeah man what's going on Ugh. let me have my tree time am i bothering you or your tree no it was fun. It was fun being on a university campus, though, because it was very different from a university campuses at home. It's oh. so big, and yeah, there were loads of. It felt like a small town almost. I guess American universities there are just so many more people. Um, sure. But like, there was a church, like a proper sized church on site on campus, oh. and like big avenues with trees and stuff. Um, 
and there were loads of like student activity people out in like the the walkway thing as you came into the uni so I was like bopping along I went and spoke to like some frat bros who were <laughs> who were recruiting and they were like hey yeah you are you like a freshman or what and I was like first of all I love you and second of all no uh, <laughs> Yes, I will not be joining. I will not be joining your sorority, but I am fascinated by this because we do not have fraternities or sororities at universities in the UK. Yeah, so I was just like, "What is this? This is such a bizarre thing." And I ended up joining a protest uh, <laughs> by accident, which was great. Uh, You're like, "Hold was- this sign," and you're like, "I got it." Yes, kind of. So I was walking along and I knew I had an hour or so. And this lady came up to me in like white trousers with with like fake blood stains all over them. Right. And they were protesting the, you know, I, I, I believe the Supreme Court are like deciding on basically whether to overturn Roe versus Wade. Yeah, uh, super fun. So yeah, great. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to moving to this nightmare country. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> get an IUD is my advice to women in America. Yep. I got an IUD on the NHS and it lasts for 10 years. There and it's go. like a really, really, uh, it's non-hormonal and a very uh, effective contraceptive. So yeah. Especially when you get it from the NHS, it, for sure. Yeah, no, forget well, the yeah. insurance. Go to England. Get, Come uh... <laughs> visit me before I leave. Yeah. We'll take you to a, a sexual health clinic and we'll get it sorted. Um... Yeah. <laughs> so she's got blood on her pants and she's like, oh. you girl understand what I'm talking about. Get over here. She comes over and she's like, we're, we're going to do a bigger rally on the 8th of March because it's International Women's Day. But um, we're doing a die-in. And I was like, oh, I've heard about these. Like, this happened a lot in the UK during the AIDS epidemic. There would be die-ins for, like, uh, gay rights and uh, more help with the, the AIDS crisis and stuff. So, but I've never had the opportunity to be in a die-in. So I was like, sure. She gave me a pair of white white trousers with blood stains on them and a coat hanger she was like you know because it's it's symbolizing back alley abortions and i was like this is really visceral i love it um so we lay down we died on the on the pathway through the university and we did that once oh no we did that twice and then they were like i basically said to them you know, both times you've had a man on the megaphone while we're talking about women's rights. And I appreciate that these guys are are helping the cause and everything, but it might be good to hear from one of these women that actually organized this. And then the guy was like, well, do you want to go on the megaphone? And I was like, I mean, yeah, sure. (laughs) So then I was just like riffing a, a, a speech about women's rights being like, I come from Europe and where I'm from, <laughs> this bullshit wouldn't fucking stand. Um, oh my God. Yes. That's so so I ended up accidentally kind of leading a protest in Berkeley. Uh, oh my and God. Then cr- You're <laughs> living the dream. You're I like know. doing a women's <laughs> rights protest at Berkeley. Like that's like, so, Oh man, you have achieved like as much of the American dream. So many people have never done. That is so great. Yeah. My advice is just hang out and then people will ask you to do stuff. Uh, <laughs> Just sort of smile at people and be chatty, and they'll be like, hey, do you want to go on the megaphone? Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, <laughs> I love an impromptu what, women's rights speech. Wow, you're so perfect for it. I mean, like, what a perfect person to find to I be know. like, okay, <laughs> can you make stuff up off the top of your head? You're like, get it. Can I? <laughs> I think I can. <laughs> And the thing, I think the thing that made me laugh the most was there was this, there was this guy there who was clearly a first year at university. He was like super young looking and he's, he's dressed like your archetypal kind of sixties hippie. He's got these like purple corduroys with patchwork on them. And he's like, Oh my God, like far out. You're from England. Like 
really kind of hitting on me and i was like listen kid <laughs> i'm 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 not a university student and you like just started uni this is never a, disregard the fact that i'm engaged this is not gonna happen <laughs> um, like you're adorable <laughs> but no thank you <laughs> Like, I love what you've got going on. The purple cords are super cute. However, there is a nice young girl looking for you, and it's not. I know. I was like, look at this this girl with blue hair who's doing this protest with you. She's right here in it. Go. There you go. There, There it is. This is what you need. <laughs> Leading protests and making love connections. It was a great day at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. Oh, and I sat in the back of, I went, um, so I was there because I'd been with my friend Camila, who is also an improviser. She runs uh, a thing called Introverted Improvisers, which is great. She does loads of audio only improv online. I would totally direct people to introverted improvisers. She's brilliant. She's doing really cool and interesting work online. Um, but we met up just to hang out. And then, yeah, she had to go home. So I was kind of killing time between seeing her and Chris finishing work. But me and her during the day, because she used to go to Berkeley, she was like, let's go inside some of the buildings and kind of see what's going on inside. And we ended up sort of stumbling into the back of a maths lecture and the two of us were like oh huh, you know what's happening <laughs> no i don't know what's happening either um <laughs> just like a big auditorium with this guy being like so if this integer is zero and the product of i is x then we can solve for y and we get six and me and camila were like mm, yeah agreed i would also have got six <laughs> because uh, <laughs> you can just go into university buildings like nobody checks who you are they don't. so if like if you're interested in being educated go to a university and just hang out go to lecture theaters go to the sciences building and go to the lectures that you're interested in nobody gives a fuck who's there they really you don't. can get a free education you don't have to do the hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt thing yeah i mean you won't get a certificate to say that you did it but you can totally just go get free knowledge it's there now the only caveat is that you need to be a bit of an invisible person like you can't True. be the person asking all the questions you can't like mm -hmm. go talk to the teacher about oh i have a question no no you can't do that you have to just sit no. in the back take some notes and then like leave but yeah, yeah that's the hard part i have never been the kind of person who blends in the background never ever <laughs> ever when i am there people know i'm there i am obvious and um i, I stick out like a sore thumb everywhere i am um it, it's it's a blessing and a curse, you know? Yeah. I like it because I don't mind attention. So I'm all like, yes, hello, I am here. Please look at me. But, um, and I don't mind, mind like asking questions, um, in class and whatnot and whatnot. Um, I, <laughs> I was never super interested in, all, I mean, I went and got a theater degree, so I was very interested in that. But the other stuff I was always kind of like, just don't get bored. Try to just be fascinated. Um, bless you. Just try to be fascinated <laughs> that people are into this kind of thing and, you know, try to look at it that way. And I mm. would always kind of, during the classes that I didn't care, I would look around yeah. and see if there were people, because I'm not shy, um, who were too shy to ask a question or they, I could tell they were interested in something else but they're like trying to like, hey, I could just, I, I have this, uh, and they feel like they can't get their word out. And I'm just loud and brash. So I'd be like, hi, excuse me, this girl over here has got a question. Or I'd be like, what's your question? Okay, no problem. I got it. And then I would just like Aww. ask that question because like, I'm not 
I've never been afraid and I'm not going to be afraid in that scenario. But yeah, that's why, so long story short, that's why I couldn't steal college because like I'd walk <laughs> in and they'd be like, this girl, who's she? I want, is she on my list? And I would not be on the list. Yeah. Where, where I don't recognize you from my class list. You've never been in a seminar with me. Who are you? <laughs> yep. And I'm just so, yeah, I, I can't, I can't hide. I am like, right there. People always see me. If you need a distraction, I'm available. Um, I just, Amazing. it's just the way that I am. It's fine with me though. My kid too. We were talking about my kid earlier and how he's charismatic and whatnot. Yeah. He's at, when we walk into a place, people are like, what? Largely cause he's a redhead. Um, but mm. also, um, but also just cause he's got the same energy I do, which is like, yeah. hello everyone. I'm here for you. Like, uh. <laughs> that's a that's a great characteristic to have though (laughs) sure sure i mean i've enjoyed it it's worked out well for me um seems to have worked out pretty well for you in the old uh becoming the leader of the protest uh, yesterday as well they're like you're important i can tell and you know how to do this get up on the mic let's do it somebody genuinely said the words great rhetoric to me and i was like (laughs) What's happening right now? I don't know what that... Okay, cool. That's the most college thing for someone to say to you. Oh my God, I love it. Nobody except for college students and college professors use the phrase rhetoric, and I love it. I know. I was like, this is... What a delicious compliment. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you mentioned that you were part of a big family where you the kind of person who wanted to, you know, get attention away from the pack or were you um, just like with the team? How did, you know, I, I've spoken about how I'm like out in front getting attention all the time. What's the uh, what's the vibe for you? Uh, I mean, we're, we're quite a noisy family I would say anyway uh well there's a mix like my mom and her younger sister are quite quiet um but then my aunties my older aunties are pretty uh like chatty and out there and I feel like I fit more into that side of the of my mom's Kennedy family um But yeah, I would definitely, I really, really, when I was little, I really wanted to hang out with my older cousins all the time. I was definitely the kid who wants to be with like the cool older kids. Um, Because mom mom has seven brothers and sisters, there's a big spread of ages of my cousins. So like my older cousins are in their early 40s now, I think. And then I have younger cousins who are like my sister is 19 so that spread of ages is quite big and so my my cousins my older cousins were like sort of university age when I was like eight or nine ish so I just wanted to be like what are Claire and Laura doing what's like cool what do the cool teenagers do um and they obviously they were teenagers so they're like <laughs> and then I had exactly the same thing when I got older, you know, my little, I feel terrible about it now. My little brother, my, my little brother always wanted to hang out with me and my friends when he was little. And I'd be like, go away. These are my friends. Fuck off. Um, so yeah, every, every, every generation of teenagers <laughs> is horrible for their younger cousins or siblings um yeah it's hard in that first round of 18 to connect with people that are further than like two years uh your junior or senior you know I find now it's so much easier I I always want to be like hey you'll be friends later like it's all right because now you know I couldn't tell you how old anyone is, you know, it's like between the ages of like 25 and 65, I talk to people all over and it's like, it doesn't, it, yes, sure. I can tell like, oh, okay, this person's older or younger than me, but like, I don't care. Like that doesn't affect how interested in, in them I am or how much I'd love to have a conversation with them, anything like that, you know? So I feel like it evens out, you know, you kind of break through that. 
Definitely. I mean, yeah, the spread of ages of people that I hang out with literally goes from like, I mean, like my little sister will come and visit and she's 19. And then people that I, I know people through improv who are like, you know, 60 or older. And I appreciate the different things that you get from different people at different ages, you know, like one of my very close friends in London, Sophie is 24. And so she's very energetic. She's just finished university. She's kind of just starting out in what she wants to do in terms of like work and what she wants to do on the, with her life. And it's really cool to, to kind of get to give a bit of advice about things and to kind of be excited with her about what she's doing but then, you know, I have friends who are in their 60s who I can be like, oh, my God, I'm freaking out about this thing. And they're like, honestly, it doesn't even matter. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the advice you get most of the time from older people is like, this isn't going to matter in two years. So why even worry? <laughs> yeah, totally. I remember when my my uh, friend, uh, so my child is four and one of my good friends, her child is 24. And um, mm -hmm. I remember when he was in uh, high school, you know, he's having these grades are doing well, not going well. And his mom was kind of like, oh, goodness, this is really important. Da, da, da. And I go over to him and I was like, no one cares what happens in high school. No one will ever ask you what grades you got ever. It literally does not matter at all to your entire adult life so do your best try make your mom happy of course but don't sweat this do not worry yeah. about this if you fail three of your classes no one will ever know ever yeah like it's not going to stop you from getting a job it's not going to stop you it like may stop you from getting into a college here or there but whatever who cares you clearly don't want that college like you don't need yeah. to be in the college if you're not doing well in this particular um uh course because that's not the college for you you know so don't worry about it you're all right and i was like and once you get to a certain age they don't even care i have a college degree has it literally helped me once no no it no. has not absolutely no. in no way other than what I refer to and people always people who have kids that are about to go into college when I say this they're like don't tell them that I'm like it's just practice adulthood it's four years of protected adult living where yes. there's people watching out for you and you learn how to live on your own to prep you for having to do it for the rest of your life that's pretty much yeah. it I mean, and you're still at a point where it would be acceptable for you to be like, shit, I've run out of money and I can't afford to eat. I'm going to go home for the weekend. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Though, to be honest, I feel like at this point in our, in our world, never a shame at any point if that happens to you to reach out to your friends or your family, please, you need some food. Give me a call. I'm available. I got some food. Like... Don't worry about oh, it. Oh, totally. Yeah. It was like back in the day, it used to be just like the beginning of your 20s, you know, oh, I had to go home. If you're 44 and you need to go home because you're having a tough time, don't feel shame. Just go home, hang out for a bit, make some money while you're in a safe space, and then move back. I mean, that's what I did throughout my 20s. I lived in New York for a total of six years, but I lived there four different times because each time I would fail and I would go back home and I would live with my mom for six months, work at a hotel job, make some money, head back, do that for yeah. about a year. Oh, I've lost all my money again and my job. Cool. Got to go back to mom's house and work at the yeah. same hotel. My sister, by the way, worked at the hotel consistently. <laughs> in the town where I grew up. And so I'd just show up and be like, hey, Kel, can I have a job? And she's like, I guess. And I was like, cool. That's so, so funny. Yeah, I was the wacky side sister who'd just like appear once every year for like a couple of months to make some money. And they were like, I guess. She's your sister, yeah. right? Yeah, getting jobs is not that easy. But, um, you know, it worked out. It was right down the street from my mom's house. I was like, awesome. I'd bank some cash, get back on the train to New York and be like, see you guys. And they're like, oh. yeah, Amy lives a wild life, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did. I, before I got into working in the arts, I went to vet school. I did. I wow. have a, I have an animal science degree because I did three years of vet school. <laughs> so when kids, 
I just hate that you have to decide what you want to do with your life when or or the the thing that we imply to teenagers is you have to know by 18 when you leave school and you've had no exposure to the outside world what you want to do for the rest of your life and you have to pick a college degree that fits with that you don't you really don't no you, like you can go back to college at 55 and do something else like I just think the advice we should be giving to kids is what are you interested in? Are you interested in biology? Are you interested in theater? Are you interested in climate change? Like what, what brings you joy or what do you feel passionate about? And then just take some subjects that fit alongside that and do whatever you want, whether it's like disparate subjects, especially because the American that's something I do admire about the American university system is it's a little longer and your first year you get to do a bunch of different classes. In the UK, you have to, you pick a subject like from day one, you're doing a chemistry degree or a biology degree or a theatre studies degree or whatever. You can do dual like degrees, but you have to pick right from the moment that you start university. I just think like, Pick a college that maybe is in a city that you like or has a, a program that you're particularly interested in or maybe they're really good at a sport that you like or whatever it is. But just pick stuff based on what you like. Don't be too worried about like, oh, shit, I, do I want to be a doctor or do I want to do this or that? Like, Just focus on the step that's in front of you. Pick yeah. the things that you're interested in for that step and then once you've done that step then you can think about okay for my second year of the university which things do I want to narrow this down to a bit more you know yeah. just do it like one brick at a time just like an improv oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to vet school and you're not a vet so that makes total sense though did you have a fun time you're you're advocating for people going for something that they're passionate about were you still like into it while you were there or did you just go because you felt pressured to be there uh, so I as a kid I had always wanted to be a vet that was like my goal my dream um so I'd always just been working towards that from when I was tiny. I can't really remember not wanting that. Um, because I loved animals and I'm, and I was, I was, I, I was, and I still am very interested in science. The difficulty that I found was that with up until leaving secondary school, I found it pretty easy to keep up with, schoolwork I and I think this is true for a lot of uh gifted kids because you spend the first 18 year of years of your life just being pretty good at the things that you're interested in uh but then obviously university is such a step up particularly if you're doing a medical deg degree um so I, I got into vet school. I went to Nottingham Uni to do vet studies. And I went from, I think I was quite unusual in that I really enjoyed secondary school. I know a lot of people have this thing of like, I fucking hated high school. It was really shit. Like maybe they got bullied or whatever. I went to kind of a wacky secondary school. We called our teachers by their first names. Um... It was a very artsy school. So even though I was doing mostly science A-levels, I also did photography and philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I was doing like artistic stuff with that. And I was in the drama club and stuff. So it was a, it was a school that was very, uh, we had teachers who were very interested in keeping you interested in the subjects. It wasn't too much of just like, you have to get your GCSEs and your A-levels and this is what we're doing to make sure that happens. There was a lot of encouragement to be like, hey, are you interested in this? Cool. Let me tell you a bit more about this then. Um, 
I mean, it wasn't a school without its problems. There were certainly problems there, but I, I really, really enjoyed secondary school. I really got on with all of my teachers. I liked the subjects that I was doing, even though, I mean, I cried a lot doing physics because it was really hard. Um, but I found it interesting. You know, we did a module of astrophysics, which was really fucking cool. Um, and our teachers organized interesting stuff. They took us to this thing called Science Live, where I got to meet like Richard Dawkins and he was talking about evolution and stuff. And there were people talking about nuclear fission and things like that. And and they were they were really conscious of making stuff interesting. But when you go to university, you go from having teachers who are interested in teaching to having teachers whose primary function is not to teach. Teachers at university are there because they're doing research, they're doing a master's or a PhD or whatever, and part of the deal of them being able to stay at the university doing the research they want to do is, and also you have to teach classes on this. And there were very few teachers that I found engaging or interesting at university. I also felt like a fish out of water because it in the UK, at least, there's a very particular type of person that goes to vet school. It's largely upper middle class to just upper class people. Huh. It's largely white people. Um, it's mostly women, actually, which is kind of cool. The veterinary field has skewed massively towards women um, in the last few years. So there's a lot of like very horsey types who come from money, who don't necessarily have to worry about having a job while they're at university. So they can handle, like we had lectures nine to five every day, Monday to Friday, and you were expected to do uh, like placements during your summer and Christmas holidays. So the opportunities to work and earn money, like the time frame to do that was very small. But I had to work and earn money because my student loan didn't cover even the cost of my rent, let alone food and stuff. So I was just constantly on the back foot. And I found the studying itself so much harder than what I'd been doing at secondary school. And there were no teachers that I felt, there was nobody that I felt like I could go to and say, this is really hard and I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it was, it's very much like you go to a lecture and it's your job to understand what's being said in the lecture. There isn't much room to be like, I don't get this and I need help. And I didn't really know how to revise properly, I would say. I didn't know how to consolidate learning in a way that I could re regurgitate it for an exam because I'd always had teachers that made sure that we understood concepts. They made, They took the time to be like, hey, do you get this? Do I need to re-explain this in a different way? Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just was almost immediately behind when I got there. And then throughout the first year, it just got worse and worse and worse. And I, and, and because I was 19, you know, you feel like, Oh, I've let this go too far. And I don't know how to ask for the help that I need. Um, and I wanted to do other things. I've always been someone who wants to do lots of different things. ADHD. Um, <laughs> so I was playing rugby. I was doing drama stuff. I was like getting involved with like university life, but I couldn't, I couldn't focus enough on the stuff that I needed to do for my degree. So I failed a bunch of exams in my first year, unsurprisingly. And then the attitude of the teachers there was not, oh, okay, clearly something is going wrong here and we need to figure out what it is. The attitude was like, well, you need to get your shit together. You're going to do retakes in the summer and it's on you to fucking sort yourself out because you're not doing well enough. Huh. And, there, and, and I just didn't, I still didn't know what I needed. To, I was like, I don't know what I need to do. I'm, I'm trying and I can't get this information to stay in my head. It's just not, there's a disconnect that isn't working for me. And so then I failed again in the summer. And then at the end of first year, I had the choice of, well, you can, you can leave 
you can stay in the vet school and get your like degree at the end of third year, or you can transfer over to an animal sciences degree. And I thought about leaving, but I was like, I'm here and I've done a year of work already. I shouldn't leave. So I ended up staying and getting an animal sciences degree. And I honestly, I should have just left after the first year because it was so clearly not the right environment for me. But I had this, because I'd spent my whole life up until that point working towards this goal, I felt like, oh, I should, I should get something out of this time here. I should get my end of third year degree. I should get that at least. And it was a waste of time ultimately. And I got other things out of being there. I have really, I have a handful of very good friends from vet school who I did get on with, but I just, I should have just left after first year really and Mm. given myself the opportunity to go elsewhere. But, you know, I don't regret that choice because I was doing the best that I could as a 19 year old trying to figure out what the best thing to do is. Um, yeah, plus it's hard and- to quit stuff. Like, it's hard to admit that to yourself, to say, and to allow yourself to make that decision. There's yeah. so many people that are, for, like, that go way further, that would have been vets for 10 years before they, like, let themselves admit. Because they're like, you know, like you said, oh, I've wanted to do this my whole life. Well, yeah. you know, the crazy thing is... Maybe maybe 15-year-old you doesn't have to be the person who decides everything. Like, you know what I no. mean? Like, how long... So here's a question. You've talked with such... The interesting uh, thread that I'm hearing in the story as you're telling it is this understanding of the way you learn and based on this experience both in secondary school and now then in vet school you had such different ways in which people were trying to teach you and you seem to understand ah yes the first way worked better for me the second way did not how long did it take you in your own self-reflection back on that experience to to get that lesson just because like it's very unlikely that like you left at 20 and were like, I understand now that the way that my brain works made this kind of learning better and this kind of learning not. You've reflected on it. How did you get to this understanding? It took a while. Yeah. I mean, I, so I left after three years and then I went, I, I just had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Um, because I'd had this goal that I'd always been aiming for And then that was gone. And without that to work towards, I was like, well, what the fuck do I do now? Um, So I ended up going to South Africa and working at a monkey sanctuary for a bit. Because, yeah, because I was like, okay, well, I'm qualified to do that. And I want to travel. I I want to (laughs) travel. And I've never been to South Africa. Yes, I'm doing that. Um, And I think I thought at the time, Oh, I'll figure out what I want to do. I I also was considering, so I'd done my dissertation about gorillas and I really liked work. I really liked working with apes in general. I think that it's interesting working with animals that are so close to humanity. Uh, So I, I was thinking then, oh, perhaps I would want to work in some sort of conservation. Basically, I think I thought I was going to become Jane Goodall (laughs) or, um, you know, do that sort of thing. But Sure, why not? Excellent goal. Yeah. But, you know, then when I I got there, I mean, I really enjoyed where I was in South Africa. It was really interesting. But that work was completely voluntary. And basically any work in that field is entirely voluntary. And it isn't very – well, A, there's not a lot of safety – and B, there's there's no real security or anything. And for the most part, it would have involved going back to university again to do like a PhD or something. Sure. If you want to work in research, you kind of, you have to work through an undergraduate and then a postgraduate and then a PhD and probably more like postdoctoral qualifications after that before you get anywhere near to being able to actually work with those animals. And I knew at that point, I don't want to go back to 
an academic university again. I don't want to do that. I'm not, I'm not cut out for that. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I, that realization about the way that my brain worked had not hit then. And then I came back from, from South Africa and I was quite ill for a while um, because I got an infection. I got an infection in my thumb uh like in a little cut or something so i had to uh i just had to like get a little bit better so i was living at my parents place and just working in recruitment because i just was like i just need to earn some money and doing a sales job it's pretty easy to like stack up money quite quickly yeah and then i was like okay well what do i want to do now i kind of want to move to london my parents both grew up around london and i have family here and I liked London as a city to visit and stuff. So I was like, I'm going to go to London and continued working and recruitment there for a bit and then got fired because it was a fucking God awful job. So I was just doing like temp work, doing admin stuff. And then really just on a whim, I saw an advert for doing uh, like courses at, the central school of speech and drama which is one of the big drama schools in london and i was like can i apply for that because i've done a science degree and it was i i don't know if i'm like what they're looking for but i'd always done acting stuff as a hobby i done amateur drama stuff i'd done drama club at school i really liked acting so i i signed up for an audition for the musical theater diploma and then i got offered a place and was like oh well but shit i can't afford this because <laughs> you don't get a, you can't get a second round of student loans in the uk if you've already if you've completed a degree mm. so i i i wrote them an email and was like yeah thanks but i can't afford it and they were like oh we have a scholarship program you should apply to this and i was like okay cool i'll apply and then they gave me a full scholarship and i was like oh okay, I guess I'm going to do that then. Uh, cool. Yeah. And, I, and I did that course. And how many years it, after leaving vet school was this? Two or three? Or two less? or three. Two or three years, yeah. Wow. Something like that. Is it two? I think two. I think two. Don't worry, I have no... Chronal, um, I'd have to. Yeah, I, I, I have, have to no idea and... the order of events of my own life. Don't you worry Check about a thing. I'm just thinking like where you're at in your development, right? Because we're talking about like 18 year olds shouldn't have a shouldn't have to make this big decision, right? So you made this big decision. You tried to be yeah. an adult about it and stick with it. You did, but it just wasn't for you. And then you're like trying to find a place, but at like so you know you're like 20 or something. 22 yeah. or something wherever 21, in, in the probably, early yeah. levels of your you know in the early stages of being in your 20s when you find this thing did it feel like oh I finally found the right path or was it just like mm. hey you know let's try it I'm open to new experiences I mean the South Africa thing clearly shows me that you're open to new experiences and you were like yeah. yes I will wildly go to an unusual place with an unusual job no problem but like you yeah. know where did this fit in your I feel better about my new path you know it, uh, it felt similar to the thing of going to South Africa. It was just like, oh, there's no monetary obstacle to me doing this because they're giving me a scholarship. Right. I already live in London. So if I just keep doing temping work around that so that I can pay my rent, like, then I'm good. And I, I it, so it was just a let's see how this goes because it was only a year long course. So I was like, you know, oh, yeah, if it's shit. Go. If it's shit, I get to sing a few musical theater numbers or whatever, like fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there were aspects of it that I loved. And looking back, I kind of wish I'd done just acting rather than musical theater. Because I don't know about the US, but in the UK, you are kind of pigeonholed if you train in a musical theater. People are like, oh, so you're not really that good at acting then? Um, yeah, I don't know. In my mind, I see them as two separate um, worlds for sure. I don't know that 
I don't yeah. know what they're, I'm sure everybody hates each other, but I've oh, never, sure. I'm very naive about those <laughs> kinds of things. I'm like, what? Everybody's nice. Is this not, yeah. what do you mean we're fighting? What are we fighting about? Like, I'm I very know. naive about that. I'm usually friends with everybody. So that's why I'm like, I don't know who hates each other. Like, yeah, same. but yeah, I get the idea of, it's almost like comedy versus drama. Like whenever you meet mm. people who do drama, they're like, ah, oh, yes, I'm very important and I do very dark pieces you do comedy oh you clearly don't understand what real human living is and I'm like yo uh comedy is actually a thousand percent harder than what you do and I can make you laugh and cry in the same scene so uh you can just stick it there drama um but yeah so Uh. I guess I guess I do feel a little bit of the pushback but uh Uh. only (laughs) since I've joined the comedy crowd and I get a lot of flack for comedy yeah but yeah so I did that course and there were aspects of it that I loved I re- I did love the performing I loved um I loved getting to get deeper into because I I I ran the one of the drama clubs at university um so I directed some of our shows and stuff at uni, but like, I had no idea what I was doing in terms of directing. I just was like, well, nobody else is going to direct this. So I guess I will. Um, so getting to go to drama school and they're like, Hey, this is the Stanislavski approach. This is Meisner, you know, like these are actual techniques for acting rather than just, "Mm, I'm going to learn my lines and then have feelings about it, I guess. Um, (laughs) So that was great. It was great to have something to actually latch on to in terms of getting better as a performer. And I loved our vocal. We had a a spoken vocal teacher who did lots of like Alexander technique type stuff with us. It's all quite wooey, which I loved. Like there was a session where she got us to sit in a circle and we all made like ocean noises together and stuff. It was like proper hippy dippy crackpot stuff, which I loved. Love it. Our singing teacher was a bit horrible. <laughs> like there would be times when we would get given feedback that was just, well, that was shit, wasn't it? And I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. I love getting, <laughs> give, be as critical as you want with your feedback. Tell me you were pitchy. Tell me you were out of time. Tell me I didn't believe your acting. Like, give me something that I can work with. Yeah. But if you tell me it was shit, I'm like, okay, what am I doing to make it better though? <laughs> um, so yeah, there were aspects of that course that I really loved. There were aspects of it that I absolutely hated. But it gave me the confidence to be like, oh, I can go and audition for things. I can get myself on spotlight. I can join equity. Like, I'd always thought of acting as something I did for fun. And even though there are two professional actors in my family, I just never really can. I don't think it ever crossed my mind to consider it as something I could do as a profession. And then once I'd done that course, I was like, oh, I can do this. And then I started going out for auditions and things. And then not long after that, I completely fell into improv by accident again because I saw an advert for people auditioning for an improvised musical in the UK. And I was like, "Uh, uh, an improvised musical? What? So I auditioned for that group and, and got a spot. Uh... And I had no idea about like Im- improv as a, the only exposure I had to improv was like, whose line is it anyway on the telly, which is so vastly different from most of what's happening in the London improv scene. So my introduction to improv was I started performing in improvised musicals um, because I had, I just, I didn't know that there were classes in improv. I didn't know that there were these improv theatres in London that were doing this stuff. I saw an advert for an improvised musical, and my train of thinking in why I auditioned was, well, the thing that I don't like about acting is I'm not very good at remembering lines. (laughs) So an improvised musical would be so much easier because I don't have to remember anything, right? (laughs) And then I started performing, 
and was like, oh no, this is way difficult. Um, so then after I'd been performing for a couple of months, I was like, right, people are using these phrases that I, like, they're talking about tag outs and edits and shit. I don't know what people are talking about. And I'm seeing people, you know, we're performing at improv venues and I'm watching other improv performances and I'm like, I love what they're doing, but I have no idea how they're doing it. So then I went and did improv classes. I started from like level one after having already been performing in an improvised musical for months and was like, right, oh shit, all of this stuff that we're doing suddenly makes so much more sense. So I took <laughs> classes at Hoopla, I took classes at the nursery, I took classes with the Free Association. I kind of just tried to take classes with everyone. And I think actually coming at it from a perspective of already performing meant that I was taking all of the teaching with a grain of salt, which I think is very useful because there are a lot of things in, in like level one improv classes where things are taught as rules that actually are things to stop people playing from a place of fear. So, you know, we, we say to people, oh, don't ask questions because what we're actually saying is, hey, it doesn't help a scene if you come into this and you're just like, where are we? What are we doing? Because you're afraid to give any information. But real people ask questions. So we shouldn't be laying down a rule that never ask a question because that's bad improv. Because then that just gives people a different kind of fear because their instinct in a scene is, I want to say, oh, how are you feeling today? Or something. But, oh, I'm not supposed to ask that because I can't ask questions, so I have to say something weird and clunky instead. Um, <laughs> so it was useful having already been performing because I'm like, oh, okay, this rule isn't really a rule. It's just a thing that you're saying to get people who've never performed anything in their lives out of their heads and into a space of playing. Okay, I get what's happening. Yeah. So I think actually... I think taking improv classes is where I started to consolidate what works for teaching and what doesn't. And I mean, I, I also throughout university and throughout drama school, I was teaching as part of my work life to make money. I, I taught from the age of like 16, I was teaching because I, I, I loved science. <laughs> so when I was in sixth form, so the last two years of secondary school, I was teaching some of the lower years of science um, because we, we ran a science club for the lower years. And that was great because I just got to teach the stuff that I was interested in. So we would be like, we're going to do a rat dissection this week. Oh, we're going to do some stuff about space. We're going to make a bridge out of paper and see how many... Uh, weights we can put on it and learn about physics that way and then once I got to once I left school and I was at university I did some science tutoring and then after I left university I was still doing a little bit of that and then when I was after I'd finished drama school I started teaching with a company called Purple Moon Drama in London doing like outreach projects for kids that were recommended to us by the local councils that was teaching drama. Um, but we were kind of using it to help kids process what was happening for them. And then once I'd, once I, once I'd gone through a bunch of level classes at a couple of different improv schools, I started the first instance of teaching improv for me was um, running classes at, the homeless shelters that I worked with just for fun just for like something to do for the clients that came into the shelter because often homeless shelters are kind of boring spaces you're just sat there you get fed and you get clothed and you know you can wash your clothes and all of that sort of stuff but people are just kind of sitting with nothing to do so I started off doing improv stuff there and then gradually got into doing more teaching through Hoopla and the nursery and stuff. And I think, yeah, taking improv classes and then teaching improv classes was kind of where it clicked for me how, like, how, how I learn and therefore how I can help other people learn, you know? Yeah. Um, 
So it's just been like a gradual shifting of gears, like slowly coming together. And now I feel like I kind of understand my process of learning and I understand how to give, I like take things that I know and explain them to other people in a way that makes sense for them. You know, I feel like I am good at taking an idea breaking down what it is that that makes that thing work and then putting that information into somebody or or helping somebody else get that information into their head you know yeah yeah absolutely I really enjoy that um do you think that the natural skills that you have you been a teacher the whole time like is that the thing that sort of what it seems to be your through line since you were doing it um uh since science club in in secondary yeah. school but you know you wanted to be a vet for you know to care take the animals do you think the that same vibe is in improv in the same way that you're taking care of animals but they're humans like yeah uh, well, for me, I'm just trying to connect themes, I guess, in my mind, as far as like you are you, you've been you the whole time. What parts of you were the vet you, and how does that become improviser you? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think I am quite empathic and nurturing. I do like, I like taking care of people for sure. I mean, this week when I've been visiting Chris, I helped, uh, but I, I was like, okay, you want to feel like Chris was talking about wanting to feel more at home in his space where he's renting. And I was like, is it okay if I like rearrange and organize your room? And he was like, that would be amazing. Cause I have to work and I never have time to do that sort of thing. So because I had the time, I was like, right, cool. I'm going to just, like move some cupboards and move the bed. Like I sorted out the wardrobe so that it makes more sense. Like that, like organized everything around Chris because I like taking care of people. And I, you know, with my teaching in improv, certainly that is a big part of what I teach. I mean, I teach a class called hot under the collar, which is all about being like flirty in improv. And I am, quite a flirty person so that's part of why I wanted to teach that because I feel like I'm pretty good at flirting with people same but I really yeah I definitely get that vibe from you (laughs) but the big thing that I talk about for a long time in the very first session is consent and the idea that like if you're doing sexy or flirty improv everybody who's involved in the scene has to be okay with that happening and we spend a lot of time talking about how to negotiate boundaries, how to understand other people's boundaries, giving people tools to stop scenes if they don't feel comfortable. Um, And that is something that I do kind of with all of my classes, even with like the vocal technique classes I do and stuff. We have a big conversation about like, okay, if we're getting into scenes, we're going to talk about people's boundaries for those scenes. We're going to talk about content that's on the table and off the table. We're going to talk about the type of touch that is okay between these people in scenes and everything. Because I think yes and has been used as an abusive tool for a long time by certain people in improv. There are people who use this idea of, well, you're supposed to yes and my ideas to trap people into scenes that they don't want to be in or don't feel safe in. So I want to give people the tool of saying no (laughs) in improv. Like you're allowed to say no. You don't have to do something that makes you feel unsafe because somebody else is like, well, you have to respect my idea that I brought in. Um, So yeah, taking care of people and helping people to connect with each other and to understand new concepts is something that is really important to me when it comes to the the type of improv that I like to teach for sure. Yeah. It sounds like a fascinating evolution in your 
you know, in your career changes and whatnot. I'm glad that you've gotten to a good place in the, you know, accepting the roller coaster of the, of your life. Um, I know a lot of people go through what you did, like went to a school and then it wasn't for them. And then that, that hangs on their neck, like an albatross, like, Oh, I gave that up. So I'm not good anymore. And you're like, no, no, you just tried something and then it didn't work out. Like, I, I can't believe I'm bringing this up so late in the podcast. Uh, yeah, strap in, everybody. Uh, I So I have this theory of 18 years that every 18 years we become a different person um, hmm. because we are on an 18-year journey. Um, I have this backed up by pseudoscience because um, <laughs> the moon goes on an 18-year cycle. So for okay. you in your life, the moon gets to the same place, um, you know, only every 18 years. So, but I think it's more cultural because zero to 18, you're your parents' kid. And then 18 to 36 is when you are an adult on the journey of figuring out how you do it, what decisions you want to make and breaking free pretty intensely from the decisions that your parents made in the first 18 years. But what we Mm. rarely think about are that there's more 18 year cycles that continue after that. Right. We're not, we don't just die at 36, like back in the day. No, there's a lot more. (laughs) So it's like 36 to 54, 54 to 72, like that those are big chunks of your life. And I think that you should give yourself the freedom to be new people with every round. If you Mm. decide if the first time, you know, you're in school, you're an A student, everything's going well for you. Awesome. Like you mentioned about gifted kids, people who can functionally do regular, like sit down in school learning that I'm super sorry, but life isn't like that. There's no experience of, of adult life where any of it is like school. So it's great that that's your skill log that, try to figure out how you can use that later. But then you are tossed into a totally different environment with different rules and different setups. And you're like, wait, I was really good at English class. Why can't I have a job at the gap? Because they're different is the thing. Like your navigating of situations and the world are totally wild. But I think the, the reason why I like to bring it up to people is that I don't think people give themselves the credit for the journey. Like Mm. you've got to ebb and flow. You've got to change. If you talk to a five-year-old and they didn't know what they wanted to go to college for, would you be mad at them? No, no, you wouldn't. Right. So from 18 plus five years, you're 23. You're going to be like 23 year old. You don't know what you want to be as an adult. No. No, I don't. And you don't get mad at them because they are on a new journey. They've just emerged into this new space. Like, so in this journey of your going to vet school, you are at the beginning of, you are a baby in your second round of this thing. And you're like trying your best, but the evolution of you as you've gotten older and learned all these other things It's as beautiful as a five-year-old who just learns how to draw, and then that leads later to, hey, it turns out that person's into architecture. What? How did those things come? You know, but it's like tiny Mm. bits to larger, you know what I mean? Like your concern to go to South Africa and help the animals is like as is like the kernel that leads you to now where you are developing these curriculum that so that students can learn how to create safe spaces and and you know stand up for themselves and create this thing like it's just part of the journey and a lot of times we think we have to have it figured out at any point past 18 you're like oh you don't understand what your life is you're like i mean what are you t- are you kidding me right now it's why people in their fifties end up having midlife crises, right? They end up like yeah. divorcing their wives and buying weird cars. Cause they're 18 mm-hmm. again. Cause they have this new, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I feel weird about this journey. I was a lawyer and now I don't want to be a lawyer. Like, and yeah. that's okay. And no, and everyone's always like, what, what do you mean? You're going to throw away all that. Who cares? You've got yeah. a journey. You've got to learn. And the only thing that, And the beauty part about, you know, all that you've answered every one of my like deep questions so amazingly well, (laughs) but like, cause, cause I feel like you 
like I have a grasp on how I'm like for me I'm like building a Jenga tower of like skills and I'm Mm. like I don't know when I'm gonna use these or if maybe I need to throw them away later but I'm Mm. like I learned how to do this and I learned how to do this and I learned how to do this and like yeah maybe I pull one out and the whole thing falls I don't know oops that didn't work out maybe should try again but you gotta forgive yourself and let yourself go on the journey and embrace the excitement you know agreed That's my whole like theory as far as like you've uh, hearing your story has been so great because like Mm. your journey of this moment where you felt like you had to do something and how it sort of slowly evolved into something that now gives you this joy. Um, So to lead into the next part of your life, we've talked about how you've done it so far. You're about to move to another city, to another community. Yeah. Are you going to bring your improv uh, to where you're going or, and, or are you planning on exploring new topics? Like what <laughs> is in your mind for the possible future? And if none of this happens, it doesn't matter at all. Oh, it's yeah. just daydreaming. What, what are you like excited about the possibilities? So this is a very interesting question, and it's one that Chris and I have been talking about a lot this week while I've been visiting. Um, So I do really enjoy teaching improv, and I feel like I teach stuff that is, like, niche or weird enough that I could slide that in to the existing improv community around, like, the Bay Area. Um, That being said... I've also had a bit of a like crisis of faith, I guess, in improv last week. But then, so what happened was Chris and I were in a comic book shop. We were looking at comics. We were having a lovely time. And Chris wanted to go to the End Games improv jam that was on Saturday, Saturday night, I guess. It was either Friday or Saturday. It doesn't really matter. We were, we, we talked about it earlier in the day and I was like, yeah, sure. Let's go. That sounds fun. And then when I was in the comic book shop, I got really upset. I like cried. I felt like I was all, almost on the verge of like panic attacky. And you know, when you're like, I don't really know what exactly I'm feeling right now, but I feel really overwhelmed. Um, it was that I couldn't quite place why I felt upset. And then Chris and I went outside. We were like talking about what, what was going on. And we were kind of pulling the threads out of like what was making me feel anxious or upset in that moment. And I was like, there's a part of me that feels anxious because that's going to be, it it would be the first time I was back in an improv in-person space for quite a long time. I'd be, Chris and I had done some improv in person uh, in July because I went over to Amsterdam for the Boom Chicago Comedy Festival And then I was so ramped up with excitement because something in person was happening again. I was just like, let me do everything. Yes, Stacey, I'll come to the musical jam. Yeah, I'll guest, I'll do a monologue for your Armando. Yeah, let me do this, let me do that. But this time, I don't know, because I'd been thinking about it all day and the pandemic and being at home so much has allowed me to think more about my life pre-pandemic. You know, we, I think we've all had more time to reflect than we're used to because as artists, often you are just constantly going. I need to make the next project. I need to go to work to earn money and then I got to go to this audition and then I have to go do this and this and this. And I'm so used to having such a tight schedule that I don't have a huge amount of time for reflection. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly to be thrust into two years of just reflection time is like very confronting. And I had a lot of realizations about how awful the improv scene can be sometimes. There's a lot of inherent racism and misogyny and transphobia and ableism and every other ism that we can think of, you know, most improv spaces are, at least for me, what I've experienced in London and in Europe, they're at the top of a pub. 
where you have to climb some rickety stairs to get in. And hey, if you have children, that's going to be difficult because we only do stuff on evenings and weekends. And also, hey, if you're disabled and you have mobility issues, you're not going to be able to get in here. And hey, if you're an alcoholic or somebody who struggles being around alcohol, the only places that this takes place are places that are centered around alcohol consumption. Uh, and hey, if you're a black person who's interested in improv, there's going to be one other person that looks like you in this room, uh, and you two are going to have to adapt to this incredibly white uh, community, and you're going to have to code switch to be accepted in this room. And hey, if you're a woman, you're going to just have to accept that a guy might follow you home from an improv event that's something that has actually happened to me. Mm -hmm. And that when you talk to other improvisers about it, they'll say, oh, well, he's just a bit socially awkward. So then you'll feel like you can't actually report that because, oh, I guess, yeah, maybe he is just a bit socially awkward and maybe I am in the wrong for treating that like it's not okay. Um, thankfully, I finally properly reported that to one of the improv theaters in London after the pan or during the pandemic rather because having reflected upon it and talked about it i was like hey no that's not okay and i sp i actually i spoke to chris about it i also spoke to joe bill who's an improviser about it i spoke to a cup it was international it was all international improvisers that i spoke to who were like no a, a guy followed you home from an improv thing no and if it happened directly after an improv thing, tell that theater. Whoever the, like, if these people are like, oh, he's just socially awkward, that is not okay that they were saying that to you. So I think part of why I got upset about the prospect of going to a jam was, what if something like that happens? What if I end up feeling unsafe in this space? Because the San Francisco community is pretty cis white male. There's a lot of tech guys who get in. Not that they're inherently bad people because they're cis white men. That's not what I'm saying. But I was like, am I going to go into this quite male-dominated space and maybe there's a guy who's weird? And I obviously I have Chris there, but I don't want to feel like I have to rely on my partner to look after me in a space. Second of all, I was nervous because I was like, hey, I kind of want to be, I potentially want to be in this improv community. I have to be good at this jam, <laughs> which is such a stupid thing to think. You know, it's improv. We're supposed to just try things out and not worry too much about it. But I was like, hey, I'm coming here as somebody who's like, I maybe want to teach stuff. If I do a bad job in a five minute scene, on a jam stage, people are going to be like, well, I'm not going to take classes with her. She clearly doesn't know what she's doing, even though nobody would ever think that. I might think that. Other people watching aren't going to be like, oh, she made one bad decision in one improv scene. She must be a shit teacher. Um, and then also, I, I just, yeah, I was, I, I so all of these things, it were like dogpiling in my head and I was just catastrophizing that like, there was going to be a weird dude who would be creepy with me. I was going to do really bad improv. People were going to judge the improv that I was doing. Maybe I wouldn't fit in with the people. Maybe I'd feel like a fish out of water. Maybe I'd get there and realize, hey, this is really not very inclusive. You know, and I, I, I was literally like, maybe I just don't want to do any improv anymore. I think the improv scene is just completely toxic and la, 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 la. And Chris was like, okay, like a lot is happening right now. <laughs> um, and we kind of talked it through and Chris was like, well, why don't we go and we'll have a signal of like, I'm not okay here and I want to leave. So we settled on that and we went and it was really fun. <laughs> I got there. The Everyone was really friendly. Everyone was really excited because they were like, oh my God, a person from the UK, what's going on? Why are you even here? Um, we signed up for the jam and Chris and I signed up to do a do uh, like a two prov together. And then they also did a women's section of the jam. And then they had a newbies section of the jam. So I got to perform like four times. So my worry about only having one opportunity to show what I can do disappeared. And the guy running, I, I think his name was Cody who was running the jam. 
was really fun, high energy. There was a real mix of people there. It was, it, and it was a really well run jam because sometimes jams can feel like they just go on forever. Everybody's fighting for space on stage. So I suppose that also contributed to my worry that it was just going to be like, I'm giving up two hours of my, at the moment, quite finite time with Chris to go to something that might not be very fun. But the way the end games ran the jam was really cool. It was like, there, I mean, it was a big jam. There were maybe like 50 or 60 people there. So everybody, you, you sign up for the, as an individual for the jam. And then you can also put t a team down if you want to perform with your team. And each, they just do sets of like five or six people. And I think they got between like five to 10 minutes for each group. So the energy is constantly up because you get new people up every time. And the groups are small enough that it's easy enough for everybody to get a decent amount of stage time within that time. So you get five or six people doing a jam who've never played together. And then, oh, it's going to be a group, uh, a team next. So that's a completely different energy from these people who've never met before. Uh, we're going to get the newbies up. So they're all people who maybe haven't done much improv. Uh, oh, it's the women's jam now. So it, it's like the it was two hours where the energy was constantly changing and people felt very supported and supportive and then there was a social afterwards we all went to a bar had some nice food had some drinks like chatted got to know each other and i was like oh yeah i very i was like i'm gonna fucking quit improv i hate everything about improv for 10 minutes and then i went to this improv event and had a really great time so I don't know what the moral of that story is. I guess I think things a lot aren't of us, as bad as you think. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of us have been in our heads. Like you mentioned with COVID, like we've had so long to reflect that now we're kind of in our heads because I understand. I totally understand this like nervous reticence to get, do anything but Zoom prov. Like I'm like, yeah, yeah. I can do that. I can, you know, um, I, I can talk to these people. And also the other part, that's really crazy is that the global zoom prov community has really just been amazing and yeah. sweet and clearly because it's global diverse. And so yes. you're not even thinking about stuff because you're just like, I just hung out with three people from Bulgaria and two people from the UK and one person from Omaha. And we just had the best time in our lives. Like this, right. the world, the, the crazy part about, especially the online communities that you and I met in is that it's very much like the sweetest, kindest of the crowds, right? Mm. That nobody, the people that are mean or going to take advantage of people aren't on the boards, as it were. You mm. know what I mean? Like, they're not chatting with each other about, like, how we can make a better future and, like, what we can do to connect with one another. You know, no, yeah. they don't care. And so we are now having to reintegrate with weirdos. People mm. that don't jive with what we've been doing for a while. And, you know, so it's really hard to try to come back to that and figure out, like, what is this going to be like? You know, like, mm. even just so many things that I've learned from all of the international improvisers, from, like, different styles to different phrases to, like, how many articles have I read that, like, Adi Wittelar has written about, like, not using certain pop culture phrases because they, like, take people out, and I'm like, this is beautiful. Or, like, na mm. how to name people without pigeonholing them. And I'm like, mm. these are things that are opening my brain and, like, things that are going on that, like, we're having these deep discussions about, like, equity and inclusiveness but that doesn't mean that everyone involved in improv across the board is in on this discussion and interest right mm -hmm. exactly you know so I think it is so valid for everyone in every kind of theatrical thing especially because I've had a few people involved in just plays in theaters right and they mm. thought everyone during the theater everything everyone during COVID was talking about oh we're gonna make theaters better we're gonna run them better mm -hmm. da, 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 da. and I don't 
if if I hear from my theater uh, people correctly, it, it's not so different. They didn't actually make the changes they were right. all saying they were going to make. It's still no. run by the same old white man boards and they're still choosing the same plays. And it's like, well, but yeah. I thought we were going to, what happened to the, we were so talking. And then when the world came back, it wasn't. So there's a lot of different possibilities and we just don't know where it's going to go. I'm yeah. just glad you're trying. And I feel yeah. like it's just a matter of, I mean, any new community, any new experience where you're going to get yourself involved in, um, you know, a new community with new people and figuring it out. It's always going to be a little weird, but like, it's extra weird because we've had all this time off to like, see that there's, uh, you know, our, we thought that we could find our perfect people in the town that we grew up in. Turns out we couldn't. So we moved out a little bit. We found some other people, but now in the last two years, I've realized that like my people are two or three in every country in the world. Like exactly. Yeah. You know? And so it's like, I like Austin and I love the community and good people. You know, we were talking about how much we love the people from the hideout. Good for them. Great. Yeah. And I love people in lots of the theaters, but you know, are we all on the same page and are we all going to play? You know, there's so much to forgive yourself, the fear, forgive yourself, the post COVID getting back into the world, baby steps. Like you have to take Mm. time for yourself But the other thing I was going to say was that you have the strength of um, being an authority in uh, in your UK world and you can bring that here. And being from somewhere else helps, especially the UK. I know that it sounds weird, but like here in the US, we hold the UK at a very high level. Oh, standard. I know. Like, I know. I get yeah. such weird special treatment just because I have a British accent. Absolutely. It's really bizarre. It's so bizarre 100%. to me because mm-hmm. I'm just not used to it. But yeah. I have so many people being like, oh, my God, are you from England? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, people just want to know what that's like. What am I doing? Why am I here? Um, yeah. And, yeah, it's it's easy to forget that while maybe you do feel like a fish out of water sometimes it also you're like the weird new shiny thing that people are like what's happening with you and there's certainly a bit of in the arts in the u.s i'm i'm getting the flavor that people for whatever reason think that oh if you went to a uk drama school you definitely know what you're doing you have like really quality training which i suppose is true (laughs) to some degree but i don't know that it's the drama teaching in the UK is better or worse than what happens here. It's maybe just different. I don't know. Oh, it has. Um, I don't know that it has any basis in reality. It is like, we are just like you're fancy and special and everything, you know, is better than what I know. Right. Like that's just, and they will hold you on a higher pedestal, but that's power. And the power that you can have would be to influence these people, to connect with the people who are there that, you know, it sounds like you found a nice crowd, you know, that did a good job, yeah, excellent definitely. organizing, good, uh, good diversity in that moment, right? But who knows, maybe you find another spot and you can be the person who's like, you know what, guys, let's try this. Or like, let me teach you my workshop on consent because I feel like you guys are not so much getting the consent before you're doing stuff. So let me see if I can't help you. And your position, both as a new person in town and also, like I said, high levels uh for our um british friends we just think that they've got knowledge that we don't have right yeah um i mean it's like but it's funny because the other the opposite is true um because improv is very much seen as similar to jazz it's kind of seen as an american art form in many ways uh even though there is improvisation that happens that has grown up spontaneously and separately from America in other places. Um, the the kind of UCB IO type of improv is a very American export. People in the UK really flock to 
learn from teachers who have studied at UCB or studied at IO or taught at the hideout or whatever, like people, people in the UK kind of revere American improvisers because they think, oh, that's the home of improv. So we're learning from somebody who gets it, who like was there when it happened, you know? Um, <laughs> And it's true, and it's not like there are bits of it that uh, there are parts of that that are true, and there are parts of that that are not true. You know. Oh um, yeah. I mean, is the idea that they give you special treatment from your because you're from the UK like good? Maybe not. Maybe not great. Maybe draws yeah. a little bit too atten- too much attention you might not want. But I'm just saying, use it. I mean, yeah, exactly. you have the power to if you find a crowd that maybe isn't being great in the way that you would want them to, I think you have the clout and the strength to swing in there and be all like, this is how I can make y'all better. And I'll tell you Mm. what I can do. Like, it's just an opportunity to consider as you're moving forward. Yes. We are all scared about getting back into in-person stuff. I mean, everything that I do right now is online. I still don't do any in-person stuff, but again, I have a toddler. So like you said, I'm one of the people placed out by the schedule of improv, but at the same time, like there's something to it. Like just the other day I got clout literally for doing these interviews. I was like, I don't know how me doing interviews helps me be a better improviser, but I'll take it. It doesn't matter what reason they give you a higher view. I'll take it because I will use that position of power to then spread a better message, to then tell people, well, the true message of improv is kindness and that's what you need to do. And if that's not your effort every minute, then that's not, then you're not doing improv. And that's just my theory, but that's how I'm spreading my own positivity into the world. Yeah, and I want to kind of hold on to the feeling that I had when I went to, when I was kind of taking the mic at the protest in Berkeley. Like, because yeah. part of that was, I don't know any of these people. I'm just the new person from the UK who they're like, oh shit, you're from the UK. You must inherently know stuff. Um, and I think it was useful for them because the stuff that I was talking about was like the American, basically, the American system is not the only way to do things. I think people can be just defeated before they even started with things like protest sometimes because they're like, this is America and this massive industrial capitalist complex is the only thing that is possible. So coming in as an outsider and being like, hey, I've lived in Europe. I I can tell you that a, a country with a, with proper social security, with a, a functioning health service with uh you know money to look after people rather than to spend on warfare that's that's possible and practical it isn't some utopian dreamland um so speaking as a voice of authority as being somebody from somewhere else i hope that i can keep that feeling of like hey yeah i'm different and therefore i can add things i hope that i don't you know, two years down the line from living here or 10 years down the line, I hope I don't feel like, oh, I, this is where I am now and and kind of give up that power of kind of being the new outsider in a way. I kind of want to keep that outsider energy going forward even when I've been here for a long time. <laughs> sure, sure. Keep the accent and you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Although I get more and more mid Atlantic because of hanging out with more and more Americans. I keep saying <laughs> really and my friends at home are like ah, why do you sound like that? <laughs> it's okay, just like a weekly zoom with like the strongest, thickest accents you have in your life and you'll be like, yeah. Oh, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Hey, it has been a total pleasure chatting with you. This has been such a great chat. I feel like we explored so many interesting topics. And thank you so much for sharing so much of your life with me. I really do appreciate it. No worries. Uh, this is this has been great. It just felt like having a chat with a friend, which I think is the best, the best way to do a podcast. <laughs> 
Thank you for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all of our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.